was called Cold. That was the name that he was called by. What's going on up there could be the most important event in history. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I said, I hope this is as close to hell as I'll ever get. Hello and welcome to the Tales from the Dark podcast. I'm your host, Bob. You're with my lovely co-host, Brittany. Hey guys, what's up? Brittany, how are you feeling? Are you recovered from our exciting weekend? Yes, I think so. We had a really, the last two weekends have just been jam-packed with adventure and fun. If you guys want to hear about that, go over to patreon.com slash Tales from the Dark. We published a bunch of photos and did a full hour long forbidden episode about this past weekend. Us ending up in Maryland, of all places, ending up in a cave with a listener, it was a ton of fun. Yeah. No, it absolutely was. So with that being said, Ms. Brittany, I just want to jump right into it. When you think of the White House, what do you think of? Government. Go on. Secrets. Secret government secrets. What about I what, actually what about paranormal events, Miss Brittany? No, no, not at all. I actually watched a short film on what all it takes to be a private chef in the White House. Really? It's a lot. It's a lot. That was years ago, but it's a lot. I mean, I would imagine you'd have to like go to the top schools, probably study under the top chefs yeah. in the world, right? Like yeah. it wouldn't just be a nationwide thing. In the world. Yeah. I, I uh, well, What's funny is I didn't watch a documentary about that, but I watched a documentary and by documentary, I mean, I watched a TikTok about the president's favorite food. And I think it was Teddy Roosevelt's favorite food was squirrel stew. Of course it was. Yeah. Why wouldn't it be? Yeah. And then there were a few that were like some of the guys like Jaffa cakes, which is a German like <sighs> little Debbie. Okay. I know there's some German listeners that are just like, I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> I cannot believe that you just said <laughs> it's like a German little Debbie. How dare you compare but, us to that brand? But it's a snack cake. Um, yeah. It was really weird to see some of the president's favorites because some were just beans and cornbread. There were an alarming amount of just beans and cornbread. Same, actually. That's really good. Yeah, there's the little that, mayonnaise in it. Okay. You, you had me and you lost me. <laughs> you know, that, uh, who, is, who is out there that likes to eat their their pinto beans you know with what? a little mayonnaise in it? Because I know we're, I'm not the only we're one. We're skipping that question. And, so, and, I, and I'm going to ask you all a very important question. Who the fuck puts mayonnaise <laughs> on hot dogs? <laughs> I, I thought. Mayonnaise and chili. The first time that we got that, I, I think we went to the root beer stand, which is like a little <laughs> hot dog joint. <laughs> You were Googling how to get a divorce. The the look of shock and terror on the young woman's face. And you're like, can I get chili and mayonnaise on those? And I think she thought you were joking. No, no, this is a joke. And then there was that like awkward, you're staring them in the eye. You're like, you better get me the fucking mayonnaise <laughs> if you know what's good for you, young lady. Oh, it's my, good. I was, I felt so bad because I'm like, I have to be in the car with this now. <laughs> you know, it's funny because like I buy those little like pickled sausages from the guy. I love for one. Pickled sausages, that's that's like, if you guys ever want to send something to P.O. Box and you're like, oh, I don't have anything cool to send, pickled sausages. Don't send pickled sausages if, if you to are the P.O. In the Box. South, if you were in the South and you can get, uh, I think they're called Hannah's, and they come in a plastic jug. I can't do the big ones, but the little plastic jugs that's like swimming in vinegar and it's red pickled so You don't. send me those, we will be best friends. Please don't. And old style. Send, they, me that, send me that in some old style and I'm set for the weekend. They can't. They no. Oh. They can't mail me a mayonnaise hot dog or mayonnaise pinto beans, so okay, you don't so get that. Like something normal. <laughs> and pickle sausages are normal. It's okay. a lot more normal than putting mayonnaise on hot dogs. It's it's fine. Yeah. So I don't know. We we've covered a lot of presidential high strangeness. We do have a t-shirt coming out at some point this year that is Andrew Jackson Ghost Hunter. Yes. We've been teasing that for a long time. I we've had the art for months and we just haven't had time to get the shirts printed. Yeah. That'll be coming. So let let us know. Are you guys wanting those as it's like an end of summer? Do you guys see yourself going to like end of summer barbecues, graduation parties? Graduation parties already happened. Labor Day parties? Sure. What's, what, Christmas ha- parties. Christmas. If you, if you guys want Andrew Jackson Christmas dash Halloween party attire, let us know. And we'll get we'll get to that here shortly. Yeah. 
I, you know, it's really bizarre. It, someone else pointed this out the other day, how fast this year really is gone. It has flown by. Now, let me ask you, because I don't want to get too political here, but do you think with the big C, not cunt, the other big C on the down, it's not, depending on who you listen to, it's actually on the uptick, but that on the downswing, the lockdowns are over. Do you think that's why it's going faster? Because last year we were all like painfully aware of, time. of, of how <laughs> slow time is passing because you're stuck in your fucking house. I don't know. I really don't know. Um, because well, let, let me tell you what it is. Let me just jump in and interrupt you because mama science doesn't know her shit. This is all to do with that goddamn CERN Hadron uh, <laughs> particle collider. collider. <laughs> That's what this really is. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, side note, before we, before we continue, uh, I, we talked about this briefly. Have you done any more research on the Chick-fil-A with a K? Because you said it had a K. No. No, I haven't. I'm not going to. And we're not doing another fucking Mandela Effect yeah, episode. No, Chick-fil-A never had a K. It did Just not. like the Chick-fil-A car. Just like... <laughs> Have we told that story on the podcast? Fucking Please. cub car. Okay, I, I, I've got I've got to bring this up. So we're driving one day. Going to get a camera. We're going to get yeah. We're going to get ca- a camera lens. What we're going. So we're driving, and Brittany looks over at this car. So that's a Chick Fil A car. Very confident. You were. It wasn't very confident. You there. It, it was something like explaining to somebody that, that water's not wet. <laughs> it, you were that certain <laughs> of, of this Chick Fil A car. I'm like. So I'm looking around, looking for the Chick-fil-A logo. I'm like, oh, it's a catering thing. What, what, where? And you're like, right there, babe. That's the university of Cincinnati's Bearcats logo. Um, <laughs> how long have you thought that that was the Chick-fil-A logo and who else have you told this to? And they didn't correct you. It's Chick-fil-A car. It's, it's fine. From now on, university of Cincinnati is actually the universe. And they're not the Bearcats anymore. It's the it's university the Chick-fil-A of Cincinnati car. Chick-fil-A's. <laughs> I, I love it. Yeah. So Austin Lawrence sent us over today's. Topic. topic. Yeah. He sent it over last week and I meant to get to it, but like everything we, we get thrown into so many different things so quickly. Yeah. I, that's an understatement. We kind of didn't get to it. So we have two, I guess two presidential episodes this week. Yes, we do. Do we tell them what Friday's app's going to be or no. do we leave it a surprise? We, 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 li- we deliver the trauma yes. unexpectedly so, unless you're a patron. Yes. So understand that this coming Friday is another very polarizing case. Maybe I, I would go as far to say one of the most polarizing cases we've ever covered Yeah, is coming this Friday. So it, it's going to be interesting for sure. Yeah. Cause it, well, it's one of those things we talked about this in the Patreon episode. There are two very clear camps for this one. There's no, no one's in the middle. It's either it happened this way or it didn't end of conversation. Yeah. Let us know what you guys think it is over on the Facebook group. <laughs> so let's talk about the white house though. So what's interesting is this isn't the first time I've, I've heard about ghosts of the White House. There might actually even be a documentary or a short film that was put out regarding this. But what's funny is I made this joke to Tyler the other day that, you know, if you if you wanted to get me to the polls, you really wanted to come out and just say, look, I'm going to run for the sole purpose of discovering. I'm, I'm, the tell, ghost I'm cat. telling you guys what happened in Skinwalker Ranch. We're disclosing all the UFO, all of them. You guys want to know about ghosts? We know about them. Let me tell you what we know. CIA, I'm making it public. I'd vote for you in a heartbeat. I don't care what, I don't care if that's all you, that was your only intention. It's like, okay, I'm going to run for 16 days and then I'm going to, I'm just going to bow out. That would be fucking fine. And just like that, you just lost your voting rights. Here's the thing. That's, that's fine. I would completely accept that if it means that we finally get full disclosure for all paranormal events. I think that there's a, weird tunnel vision that it's just UFOs and it's not. We are forgetting like the snally gasters of the country. Yeah. All I'm saying is I feel like the political parties as a whole have lost their way. They need to focus on high strangeness. We need to focus on high strangeness. Can we have a high strangeness party? Sure. At what age? I think it's 35 that I can run for president. So six more years. Oh God. God. Can you imagine like everything we've said on the podcast being used against me in a political race? How about we don't do that like, and don't hmm. manifest that? No, I'm just out of curiosity. Uh, Mr. Hicks, do you remember when you put your sister's Furby in a microwave? <laughs> that is. <laughs> yes, you. I do. And I'm going to do that to all Furbies. Well, I'm like, yeah, well, here's the thing. Hasbro, big Hasbro, <laughs> big Furby. I'm shutting the fucking factories down. First yeah. thing I'm doing. Yep. Someone's going to clip that and be like, okay, this is terrible. Anyway, let's talk about the Washington Post article titled, Is the White House Haunted? The History of Spooked Presidents, Prime Ministers, and Pets. Okay. 
So it starts off, this is, I think, what had Austin hooked. On a lonely night in 1946, President Harry S. Truman went to bed at 9 p.m., and about six hours later, he heard it. Knock, knock, knock. The sound up against his bedroom door wakened him. He wrote to his wife in a letter that is still archived in the Presidential Library and Museum. This is a quote. I jumped up and put on my bathrobe, opened the door, no one was there, he wrote. Went out and looked up and down the hall, looked in your room and Margie's, still no one. Went back to bed after locking the doors and there were footsteps in your room whose door I'd left open. I jumped and looked and there was no one there. The damn place is haunted, sure as shooting. Sure as shooting, I trust him. Secret Service said not even a watchman was up there at that hour. You and Margie had better come and protect me before some of these ghosts carry me off. This is as dramatic as you are. I'm 100% here for this. So in addition to its political ghosts, the White House has long housed unsettling specters of a different, more bump in the night if num- kind if numerous former leaders and their staff members are to be believed. Whether one embraces or mocks the paranormal, to many uh, the many accounts that have spilled out of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue over two centuries give ghosts the undeniable place in the country's history. The sightings, which have been documented in eerie detail by scholars and newspapers, involve a former president who appears when the nation needs a leader the most. A daughter who pleads in vain to help her doomed mother and a first lady who is sadly perpetually stuck doing the laundry. That would be the worst existence of known to man. We've talked about this. You know how fucking shitty it would be if you died in the afterlife as you had to go back to your day-to-day nine-to-five? Yep. No, I'm not doing it. That's like the ninth circle of hell right there. Guaranteed is we have to go back to work after we die. Yep. Jesus. Okay. Jared Broach is the founder of the company Nightly Spirits, which offers tours of haunted areas in several cities across the country. But when Broach started the tours in 2012, he only offered one, the White House. How the fuck do you approach the White House? And like, say, okay, let me do a ghost hunt. Look here, Mr. President. <clears throat> I, I understand the leader of the free world and all that jazz, but let me tell you about ghosts. You know Zach Baggins? And then the president just slams the fucking door. That's how it should have gone. Yeah, hundred percent. You you know it didn't go that way. It's like oh, what? Drunk, <laughs> drunk tourism? Sure. How much you want to bet? It's literally not even him allowed in the White House. It's literally just around <laughs> the lawn. He walks around he, the fence and he he's walks just around like, the gate. You see, you see that you see that window over there? No, I can't see without the binoculars, Jerry. Yeah, that window <laughs> that that has the lady ghost. That has the lady ghost. That's it. <laughs> that's that's Where, it. Where's my five hundred dollars? Yeah, fifty bucks, please. So the White House has the best ghost stories, and I'd call them the most verified, Broach said. Honestly, we could do a 10-hour tour if we really wanted to. Yeah, if you focus on every fucking window. (laughs) Come on, Cherry. We know your secrets. One of his favorite stories is about David Barnes, who sold the land where the White House sits, and whose voice has been reportedly heard in the Oval Office. Could you imagine, like, coming from the family that sold the land to the White House? Look, I I finally get to use one of my uh, filters here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Be quiet. So this is, this is a quote. I'm Mr. Bones. Broach would always say during tours when he got to that part of the story, I have been waiting and waiting and waiting <laughs> for an opportunity to use that. And I know. I understand. They're like, oh, oh, well, great. Tales from the Dark School and all cookie cutter podcast. Understand. I've had two different audio interfaces with this option and Brittany never lets me use them. Correct. I don't. I don't. And there's th- a reason. Because this is phenomenal. Because, because this is the who, best content I, anyone's ever asked for. Yes, honey. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Broach would always say this. So asked if he believed in ghosts, Broach said for sure. And then pointed to more prestigious authorities. It's like Zach Baggins. Anyway, if I said no, I'd be calling out eight different presidents and calling them all liars, he said. One of them would be Abraham Lincoln. He reportedly received regular visits from his son, Willie, who died in the White House in 1862 at the age of 11, which was probably by typhoid fever. There's a lot of, like, conspiracy around the way that his son died. I don't know if you're familiar with this at all. No. Let it, Let me know if you guys want me to dive into that conspiracy because he was fine and then instantly sick and he died. But it was also 1862. <laughs> so, like... <laughs> Healthcare definitely wasn't up to the standards yeah, it like, should be. <laughs> that, that kind of stuff did happen where someone was just, like, fine and then they died really quickly. But there's a lot of conspiracies that... that, that Surround was, it. Yes. So anyway, Mary Todd Lincoln, who was so grief-stricken by the loss that she remained in her room for weeks, she also spoke of seeing her son's ghost once at the foot of her bed. There are also reports of hearing Thomas Jefferson playing the violin and Andrew Jackson swearing. 
that part's hilarious because there's a supposed EVP that's like considered meme culture in the paranormal world. Have you ever heard this? No, no, I have not. I can't play it because a company bought the rights to the clip. So we can't play it or we'll get in trouble, but it's Andrew Jackson. And they say it's an EVP of the oval office kicking his, cause he had this bad habit of apparently stub, stubbing his toes. Cause he walked barefoot. Cause because he could you're the president, he stubbed his toe and he screams, God fucking damn it. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> and it's, it's a supposed EVP of Andrew Jackson. And oh my God, I first saw this on Reddit like three months ago and I'm like, Oh, th- this is fake, right? Like it's fake. And then I went down the Andrew Jackson rabbit hole, which partially inspired, uh, the, the Andrew Jackson, yeah, the Andrew Jackson ghost, ghost hunter, hunter. <laughs> that, that plus the bell witch story, but it was so fucking hilarious that, cause it just, it doesn't, it, when you, I think the white house, I think like prestige and I think everyone's all buttoned up and everyone's real. And then here's Andrew Jackson. God fucking damn it. Fuck. Yeah, that sounds about right. Well, and it's one of those things that, like, it's it's so normal. Like, I, don't, I, I can't relate to presidents very often, but I can totally relate to stubbing my toe and screaming at, at the top of my fucking lungs. Same, actually. So after his assassination, that's a great segue, in 1865, Lincoln apparently joined his son in the phantasmal roaming. I'm going to start I'm gonna start calling that. Every time we talk about a uh, full-bodied apparition, I'm going to say phantasmal roaming. No. Nope. 100%. Please don't. First Lady Grace Coolidge spoke in a magazine uh, and accounts of seeing him looking out a window in what had been his office. Many more sightings would come in the decades and presidential administrations that followed. Queen Wil- Wilhelmina of the Netherlands was sleeping in the Lincoln bedroom in 1942 when she reportedly heard a knock on her bedroom door, opened it to see the bearded president and fucking fainted. <laughs> that is, and that's the thing. Like, it's so believable when you add... A queen just fucking fainted. <laughs> a woman whose responsibility as an entire country saw Abe, Abe Lincoln's ghost was like, nope. Nope, not today. Peace out. Now we know how to defeat the Netherlands in armed combat. We just got to get the ghosts on our side. What was that movie? Uh, which Lord of the Rings was it when they got the entire army of the dead? The, was um, that Return of the King? No. Maybe. Like, maybe? It was a... Th- the third one. <laughs> yeah, I think it's Return of the King. So all we have to do is is repeat that. <laughs> we have to call, call upon the, as the heir of is it the heir of Gondor. Please stop. I'm going to stop. I'm too I, I'm, tired. I'm, I'm, I'm pissing so I'm, many people yeah, off. Right I'm too now. tired to to correct you. <laughs> anyway, what's interesting is I was going to bring this up when we were going to cover Winston Churchill, but two years earlier, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, according to accounts, had just stepped out of a hot bath in that same room was wearing nothing but a cigar when he encountered Lincoln by the fireplace. This is why I love Winston Churchill, because this isn't his only... So imagine, you're butt-ass naked, you're the prime minister, you're just just fucking slamming on a stogie. And this is how baller Winston Churchill was with his paranormal happenings. He looks at him and says, Good evening, Mr. President. You seem to have met me at a disadvantage. (laughs) Tell me that's not the most baller shit you've ever heard. That's goals right there. Now all you have to do is become prime minister. (laughs) Okay. Well, I got to move to the UK first. (laughs) I have to completely delete the podcast, become prime minister, sleep in the White White House, be naked with a cigar after a bath. Ah, This is too much work. (laughs) In his his research, Brutes that he found that Lincoln seems to be the most common visitor among the White House ghosts and also the one who carries the greatest burden. This is a quote. They say Lee can always come back whenever he feels the country's in need or in peril, Broach said. They say that he just shows up, uh, striding down the second floor hallways and raps on the doors and stands by windows. What's funny about this, do you, do you remember the YouTube channel Epic Rap Battles of History? So they did it an Epic Rap Battle. I think it was Obama versus Mitt Romney. Yeah. And the ghost of Lincoln comes back. That was inspired by the the true ghost stories of Abraham Lincoln. Oh, man. Yeah, the they, uh, Epic Lloyd and the other guy did a, an interview, and they said that someone was telling us about the ghost of Abe Lincoln who just fucking shows up when the country's not doing well, and he's like, hey, I'm fucking Abe Lincoln, bro. <laughs> Are you sure you want to go this route? You, sure you want to do this? You're looking like a bag of ass in front of Abraham Lincoln. I have a statue. What do you have? Anyway, in an 18, 1989 Washington Post article, White House cur- curator Rex Scouton said that President Ronald Reagan had com- commented that his dog would go into any room except the Lincoln bedroom. He'd just stand outside the door and bark. Among other spirited stories are those about Annie Strout, Strout, 
S U A R A T T. Surat? Surat? Anyway, some of the sworn her ghost knocks on the front doors, pleading for the release of her mother, Mary, who was convicted of playing a role in Lincoln's assassination and was later hanged. Mary Surratt, Lewis Powell, David Harold, and George Azerot were all hanged inside Fort McNair in Washington on July 7th, 1865. That's dark. Oof. This this article has a way of like being like really funny and then being like, hey. Actually. Actually, presidents kind of suck sometimes. Oof. Okay. Let's go ahead. Let's let's continue. There are also haunting accounts involving two presidents' wives. Abigail Adams was the first lady to live in the White House and use the East Room to dry sheets. Since her death, there have been reported sightings of her likeness in that area. She walks, according to the accounts, with her arms outstretched as if still holding clean linens. That's just like, uh, we talked about, that's the fucking worst. Please don't do that. Uh, Dolly Madison, the stories about her are to be believed, seemed to have chosen a better eternal pastime, taking care of the garden. Okay, that wouldn't be that bad. Sunburn? What if she had, like, constant sunburn? Oh, she is a ghost. So, yeah. What if you died with sunburn? You know how much it would suck? Oh, because that's the thing about sunburn. It, it, it's not like it hurts a crazy amount, but it's a minor annoyance with literally everything you do. You could feel, like, every fiber of your clothing scratch against it. At that point, I'd have to be a nudist ghost. <laughs> I'm sure it'd be fine. It's fine. Uh, during the Woodrow Wilson... All right, Wilson- Prime Minister, calm down. <laughs> You seem to have caught me in a disadvantage. <laughs> Every time that someone, not that it happens very often, but next time someone catches me naked, they're just like, hmm, yes. You seem to have caught me in a disadvantage. I'm looking forward to sexy time. Uh, during the Woodrow Wilson administration, <laughs> staff members reported seeing her ghost as they were about to move the Rose Garden. They apparently decided afterward to leave it where she wanted it. Well, that's, that's nice of them, at least. Consider it. It also seems like a lot of presidents seem to take ghosts seriously. Have you noticed that? Yeah, they just accept it. They're like, all right, that's fine. Again, that just goes back to point one. What do you know? What do you know that we don't know? Tell me right now. Anyway, the First Lady is also connected to another storied Washington location. When the British burned down their home during the War of 1812, she and President James Madison moved to the Octagon House on the corner of 18th Street and New York Avenue, making its temporary white. I did not know that that was the temporary White House. I didn't either. I got to brush up my history. Same. Uh, Unexplained occurrences there have been linked to the deaths of three women, including two daughters of the wealthy man who built the house. In both incidents, according to the newspaper accounts, the woman had argued with their father about who they wanted to marry and then fell from the same staircase. Yeah, she, she, (sighs) she fell. What? (laughs) Look, we were fighting. We were fighting. Then no, they both fell after the argument from the same staircase. Uh Ah, you can, you can probably get away with one, <laughs> but when it happens twice in a row, you had to start wondering like, man, women weren't people back then. Mom, 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 mom. Okay. Bob way more trauma than I was ready for. Well, this reminds me of a, of a, what was her name? Valerie deal Armstrong. Why do I remember that name from the collar bomb robbery who had murdered like three of her husbands? Oh my gosh. That it's, sounds about right. It's like after the second one, you got to start wondering, is it me? <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Yes, yes it actually is. Uh, so bells could be heard from the uh, house when no one else is there to ring them. Reads a 1969 uh, article about the location. A specter of a girl in white would be seen slipping up the stairway. Terrifying screams and morbid groans could be heard emanating from the house. Some insisted that it was impossible to cross the hall by foot in the stairway on certain days without unconsciously uh, going around some unseen obstacle on the floor or falling down. So they die and now they have to make everyone else's life miserable. Yeah, they, they died and turned into a fucking Ottoman. I don't, <laughs> I don't <laughs> think that's how that works. <laughs> I love articles like this because it makes me like second that's why guess I, everything I know about the paranormal world. <laughs> that's why Andrew Jackson actually stubbed his toe all the time. Oh, because it was a ghost Ottoman of Lincoln. <laughs> Jackson was doing fine. So like, it's like, I'll just be an Ottoman for a while. Those fucking shapeshifters. Oh God. Uh, <laughs> newspapers once treated stories about ghosts with far less skepticism than they might today. Another Washington Post article published in 1907 describes the police department's effort to address paranormal activity in Georgetown with the headline spooks baffle police. Despite the vigilance of captain Schneider and his officers of the seventh precinct, they continue night after night with their weird ghost like tricks. The author wrote, the police are unable to stop the shower of gravel and stones, which appear to be the favorite means of manifestation of these materialistic ghosts, nor are they able to discover where they came from. 
I love that, that they called the fucking cops on a ghost. And then the cops showed up and tried to do something about this. Listen, sir, we're here to help. If it the, was actually you and Tyler, you tra- time traveled. <laughs> if Dan Aykroyd had, had been around back then, I keep talking about Dan Aykroyd a lot lately, but it would make a lot more sense. I just, I can't imagine calling our local police department like, look, there's a ghost in our house. Is this the same house that heroin in the bathroom? Look, <laughs> shut the fuck up. That's not what we're calling about now. Why was Did, I literally about to say something about didn't that? Didn't you guys just call because a car was being pushed by another car outside your house? Shut the fuck up, operator. <laughs> That's not what this is about. Get over here. We have a specter. We don't need you to read our profile to us. <laughs> oh, Quit God. keeping tabs. Uh, and then there's another headline for the 1903 Post story, which ran next to an advertisement offering a lawn swing for $3.95. Why include that? Said White House ghost changes in the mansion have driven them away. In the article, a longtime White House servant laminated how laminated. That's not, I don't think that's the word they should have used there, but that's what they used was laminated. L-A-M-I-N-A-T-E-D. How renovations had cleared the mansion of the spirits that kept him company on lonely nights. Laminated also means that it like to go on about. I think lamented is that word, not laminated. I'm, I might be wrong. I think mm, I might be wrong. And I'm, I'm pretty look, sure I'm right. Look this up as I continue. Look up what lamented means. L A M E N T E D. Anyway, he described them as gliding up public stairways and down private ones. It's the truth, the gospel truth, said Jerry Smith, who was described as a spender. I'm sorry, described as spending a quarter of a century at the White House. Times are not what they used to be about the house. Ever since I first went into the White House, I've seen the spirits of Mr. Lincoln and other presidents as they died. But, you know, they don't always like the new places. And I never see the side of Mr. Lincoln or General Grant anymore. But Lincoln, it seems, would not be scared away so easily. Maria Bond, who worked for Eleanor Roosevelt, reported seeing him on his bed, pulling on his boots. Her screams apparently brought Secret Service agents running. Mrs. Roosevelt, in a 1932 talk about life in the White House, told a group in San Antonio that she felt another presence when she walks, uh, when she walks and works in a room where many presidents also worked. She was quoted as saying, I get a distinct feeling that there's someone in the room, she said. What'd you find out? I don't think, I think you're right. You think I, I'm right? I, I think I was thinking of Lamented, too. Okay. We got to get a hold of these people and tell them to proofread their articles. Jesus. They're derailing, the our, they are derailing our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, How dare they're, you? They're to blame. <laughs> uh, after Truman wrote to his wife about the knocks on his door, the president's daughter wrote him back. Margaret Truman, in a 1986 biography of her mother, said she and her mom were skeptical of the existence of ghosts, presidential or otherwise, and she wrote her father saying so. How are you going to tell your dad, the fucking president, he's wrong and he didn't hear knocks on the door? She's sassy like that. This reminds me of Alice Roosevelt. I was, yeah. Yeah, it does. I think we've told this story, but Alice was known to like, she was a fucking terror, smoking cigarettes, cursing, not curtsying, rolling her dress up, the whole nine. And she was one, uh, President Roosevelt was once asked, like, hey, why aren't you taking better control of your daughter? Like, why are you letting her do these things? He's like, look, I can either run the country or I can control Alice. No one can do both at the same time. <laughs> that is, again, I, I fucking love old timey presidents who just like didn't give a shit about what they said to the press. That's fair. So anyway, he replies to his daughter calling him a liar and says, I'm sure they're here and I'm not so much alarmed uh, to meeting up with any of them. I'm sure old Andrew Jackson could give me good advice and probably teach me a good swear word or two, he wrote. And I'm sure old Grover Cleveland could tell me some choice remarks to make to some political leaders, so I won't lock my doors or bar them either way if any of the old coots in the pictures out of the wall come out of their friendly frames for a chat. Oh my gosh. I love that he was so welcoming about this. What if? Okay, now I'm, hear I'm, me I'm, out. I'm here for it already. Now, he, now hear me out. What if they've developed technology to trap paranormal instances and are keeping the presidents like artifacts in the white house to mentor the new presidents. And that's why they don't talk about it. You know, or this, they tell the government secrets because who the fuck are, who the fuck are they going to tell? This is inevitably going to be someone's first episode. And they're going to be like, I wasted a fucking hour. listening <laughs> to these two. <laughs> what happened? We're, we're in good mood today. Yesterday we had a really rough day. So oh God, it was we're, bad. we're happy today. We're having a good time. I'm going to let you take over and, and tell us. I think we have a ghost cat or something. Yeah. We have the demon. We have the DC, the DC demon cat, the okay. DC demon cat. Yeah. But first I got to tell you guys what the definition of laminated is. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. 
Oh, I was excited. I was like, all right, well, here we go. It's to put a piece of paper between two pieces of plastic and meld it together. Ah. Yeah, I'm positive they didn't mean laminated in this article. Then <laughs> I, I'm 96% sure. The demon cat, also referred to as the DC, is a ghost cat who is who is reported to haunt the government buildings of Washington, D.C. Um, it primarily haunts the city's two main landmarks, the White House and the United States Capitol. The story of the demon cat dates back to the mid-1800s when the cats were brought into the basement tunnels of the United States Capitol building to kill right, ma- mice and rats. Excuse me. Love it. Love it. That's what cats do. Legend states that the demon cat is one of these cats who never left, even after its death. Its home is supposedly the basement crypt of the Capitol building, which was originally intended as a burial chamber for President George Washington. According to the legend, the cat is seen before presidential elections and tragedies in Washington, D.C., allegedly being spotted by White House security guards that on the nights before the assassinations of John F. Kennedy and Abraham Lincoln. It is described as either a black cat or a tabby cat and the size of an average house cat. However, witnesses report that the cat swells to the size of a giant tiger or an elephant said to be 10 feet by 10 feet when alerted. The cat will then either explode or pounce at the witness, disappearing before it manages to catch its victim. A, an elephant, really? Okay, so I, I have to I have to interject here because we have a couple DCs in this house that I need to publicly fucking shame because they tried to kill my dog today. Yeah. So I come home from work. <clears throat> uh, and I go in our back door into our kitchen, and I notice that there are several things awry. <laughs> Just so, a couple. <laughs> so I'm led to think two things. Our cats are assholes or we have a poltergeist. <laughs> Both are equally likely given our, you know, Track un- record. unique lifestyle that we do, <laughs> that we lead. So yeah. I think the dog's dead and I go into a panic because he's on his side. He doesn't appear to be breathing. He looks like a propane tank. He's very bloated. I see a Tim Hortons container on top of his crate. And then I notice your little bitch of a cat <laughs> is sprawled out on top of his crate. So we, we have to keep the dog in a crate while we're gone or else he also destroys the house. She is licking the frosting off of his crate. She gets panicked and runs. I pick up the Tim Hortons box and there's Tim Hortons little Tim bits all over the fucking kitchen. <laughs> she, the, she had knocked it on top of his crate and he had gnawed a hole in the side of it so they would fall down into his crate, probably into his mouth. Knowing him, <laughs> she was sitting up there just rattling it, a couple would fall out, they'd land in his mouth, he's having a good time. The fucking freezer door is open. <laughs> Everything is knocked off the top of the refrigerator. Yeah, that sounds about right. And the cats run away. I open the crate thinking like, holy shit, the dog's dead. No, he's in a fucking food coma. I let him out. He drinks an entire an entire container of water, throws it up on the floor, goes back to drinking water, goes back into his crate after I cleaned it out from all the donut resin, resin and all the other nonsense, falls back on his side and fucking goes to sleep. <laughs> I think he's dying because there's there was chocolate ones in here, but there was like most of the chocolate ones were on the floor. So I'm like panicking at this rate. No. At this point, the cats are actively avoiding me, except for my cat is taking a he's going to the bathroom and you can hear it <laughs> from the kitchen as I'm cleaning up. So I know for a fact he got into some Tim bits. <laughs> anyway, they're both like super grounded right now. So if you guys don't hear them the rest of the episode, that's why you don't hear them because they're fucking grounded. They are grounded. And anyway, Bear is good. And Bear is fine. He's running around being an asshole as well. Like I said, he looks like a, like he looks like a miniature propane tank because he's so bloated from these fucking Tim bits. <laughs> anyway, please continue. Okay. In the 1890s, the cat is said to have been inexplicably, inexplicably vanished when some Capitol Hill guards fired their guns at it and another supposedly died of a heart attack after seeing it. A cat scared you to death. The official last sighting of the alleged ghost was during the final days or aftermath of World War II in the 1940s. Love it. I love cat. I love animal ghosts because they're so uncommon. But this one was just doing its job. He was just vibing. He was just vibing, man. Then fucking murkin' dudes. Yeah. By accident. He was just vibing. Okay, so this one's going to be interesting. Did you know that Abraham Lincoln attended seances? No way. Did he really? Yeah. 
Was it the Catholic Church? No, we'll get into that. But that was one of the most interesting findings about doing this research in the articles that Austin sent over was Abraham Lincoln, his wife, was a big part of the spiritualist movement. And a lot of people don't know that. Really? Does she go under a pseudonym? So we'll we'll get into all that. So this article is called Seances in the Red Room, How Spiritualism Comforted the Nation During and After the Civil War. It starts, death plagues us all. It is the only certainty in life, that plus taxes if you live in the U.S., and plays an integral role in the human experience. When a loved one perishes, it's their survivors who are left to pick up the pieces. In a time of mourning, grief-stricken loved ones turn to a plethora of coping mechanisms, and over time, the way we mourn has evolved dramatically. Oftentimes, people turn to their organizations of religion or spirituality as a source of comfort and connection to those who are lost. Many White House ghost stories, most of which are centered in the Lincoln family, have roots in the 19th century, when spiritualism and seances were rather common because the Civil War changed not only the way that Americans understood death, but how they mourned. I am excited to get into this. I really am. Because we've been meaning to cover the spiritualist movement for a minute. And yes. this is this is going to play a role in that when we finally get down to the nitty gritty and cover it all. Yeah. So the bloodiest conflict in the nation's history was the American Civil War from 1861 to 65, fought over the expansion of slavery. The Civil War resulted in approximately 750,000 American fatalities, nearly equal to the total number of American deaths in the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, the Spanish-American War, World War I and World War II, and the Korean War combined. I had no idea it was that deadly. I did. I I knew a lot died, but like when you combine that many different major conflicts. Yeah, I I did. I remember that was very stressed in my history class, how many people actually died during the Civil War. Uh, So never before had the nation experienced death like this. It's important that the survivor understands the meaning of their loved one's life and death in order to properly grieve, according to historian Drew Faust. The particular circumstances of the Civil War often inhibited mourning, rendering it difficult, if not impossible, for many bereaved Americans to move through the stages of grief in an environment where information about deaths was often wrong or entirely unavailable. Yeah, that was because a lot of these folks died and they just their families were never notified. No, because they didn't know. Yeah, and it was very commonplace for, it, it, let's say your troop was defeated, for you to just merge with another one and continue on in the war effort. So yeah, it so they had no idea where you were. There yeah. was no docu- proper documentation when it came to that. Exactly. It's not like like the deployments today where you know, okay, I'm going to be back on this date roughly and I can keep in contact via Skype or, or, or whatever. Whatever, yeah. Yeah, di- different different times. Uh, survivors found themselves both literally and figuratively unable to see clearly what had been lost. When these soldiers perished far away from home, observance of grief was impossible and the state of the soul that is ceased at the time of death was forever lost to the family. That's a really interesting way to put that. Yeah. Uh, bodies were left on the battlefield for a variety of reasons. Lack of a structured recovery system, attempts to disgrace the enemy and lower its morale, junctures of battle, and discrimination between officers and their subordinates. That was another common thing, and I want to throw this out there. I, I found this when I was in college, and I, we were doing something regarding the Civil War. If an officer thought that a person didn't fight properly, and this is incredibly, incredibly common with the Confederates, didn't put up enough moxie, wasn't brave enough in their war, they would refuse to bury them. They would dismember them and leave them to scare off Union troops. I, I mm, yeah, that's. I don't want to talk about that. Actually, yeah, that's fucked. Uh, so while spiritualism, a belief system centered on the doctrine in which the dead can communicate with the living, that's uh, paraphrasing, but yeah, we'll ex- go with it. Existed long before the Civil War. It was not popularized until mid to the late the mid to late nineteenth century. By 1897, it was believed that spiritualism had more than 8 million believers in the U.S. and Europe, mostly drawn from the middle and upper class. That's accurate, and I found that out when I was doing the uh, the history of the Ouija board. That it was mo- mostly middle and upper class people who believed in spiritualism, and lower class people didn't believe it in it at all. Because when do you have time? Exactly. When do you have time to believe in that kind of stuff? Between your three jobs. Yeah. Uh, the uniqueness and scope of death during the Civil War left thousands of families without the proper outlets to grieve. It transformed wives into widows children into orphans, and mothers into mourners. According to one study on the rise of spiritualism during this 19th century, spiritualistic activity increased rapidly in America at a time when bereaved citizens were seeking new assurance of continuity and justice after death, and when traditional religion was becoming less able to offer this assurance. That is an amazing way to... To phrase the spiritualistic movement. Yes. For instance, seances were used as an attempt to reach out to lost loved ones with the assistance of a trained medium. 
This professional, I'm sorry, these professionals claim the mystic ability to communicate with the deceased. Spiritualism expanded so rapidly during and after the Civil War because it offered grieving survivors closure that the war denied them. Ordinary Americans were not the only ones that turned to spiritualism as a coping mechanism. In fact, First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln, the wife of Abraham Lincoln, practiced spiritualism in the White House. Mrs. Lincoln was born into a wealthy Protestant family from Kentucky in 1818. Throughout her life, she suffered immense amounts of loss, including her mother at a very young age. Three out of her four children and the brutal assassination of her husband uh, before her very eyes. She first turned to spiritualism as a tool for processing her grief after the death of her second youngest son, William, or Willie, in February of 1862. We talked about Willie a little earlier in this episode. He was the one that was running down the hallways? Yes, and, and appearing at the, uh, the foot of the bed of people. Yeah. So according to a newspaper article published the day after Willie's death... His sickness and intermittent fever, assuming a typhoid character, has caused anxiety to, to alarm the family and friends for the week past. The president has been by his side much of the time, scarcely taking a rest for 10 days past. Willie was only 11 years old at the time of his passing, and he was uh, believed to be a victim of typho uh, typhoid fever. First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln became inconsolable after the passing of Willie and desperately searched for an outlet for her grief. Shortly after his death, she was introduced to the Lorries, a well-known group of mediums that were located in Georgetown. Mrs. Lincoln found such comfort from the seances held by the group as she started hosting her own seances in the Red Room of the White House. Could you imagine that in modern times? They would eat him alive. Whoever. Her. Yeah. Him. No, anyone. No doubt about it. Because it's, this, again, this is pre-Satanic Panic, so this wasn't the devil. Yet. Yet. <laughs> Yet is the key word. Yeah. There's evidence that suggests that she hosted as many as eight seances in the White House and that her husband was even in attend attendance for a few of them. The seances proved to be such an effective coping mechanism for Mrs. Lincoln that she once remarked to her half-sister that Willie lives. He comes to see me every night and stands at the foot of the bed with the same sweet, adorable smile he always had. He does not always come alone. Little Eddie, her son that perished at the age of four, is sometimes with him. Through spiritualism, Mrs. Lincoln, like many Americans at the time, found solace in the belief that one could communicate with loved ones. Despite this, Mrs. Lincoln did take a step back from her practice after several months due to societal societal pressures. So I'm not going to go through the rest of the article, but the, the, the problem that I have with this is it was quite literally people were saying that you're a godless woman. Because you wanted to have seances. Because she was having seances and believing in something that wasn't written in the Bible. That fucking sucks. You have a grieving mother who literally finally was feeling some relief from her pain. And then had to step away because of her duty to her country. Yes. And the opinions of others. And it just makes you wonder if future leaders learned that lesson and just did this stuff in private. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, 100%. All right, Miss Brittany. So before we go, I'm going to throw this back to you. I know you've got a couple shorter ghost stories and, and happenings within the White House. So what else do you got for us? 1901 to 1904. Jeremiah Jerry Smith. I knew it was Jerry. Yeah, it's always fucking Jerry. It's always fucking Jerry. Started working at the White House during the uh, Ulysses S. Grant administration in the late 1860s as a footman and served as a footman, butler, cook, doorman, and official duster until his re retirement approximately 35 years later. Can you imagine seeing that on a fucking resume? I was the official duster at the White House, so you have to hire me. <laughs> Look at my qualifications. Uh, he was a popular character and storyteller. Reporters could always count on Smith on a slow news day. He claimed to have seen the ghosts of Lincoln, Grant, McKinley, and several first ladies. 1911. One little known spirit is uh, the unidentified 15 year old boy called the thing that greatly frightened the Taft and mystic staff of 1911. That would fucking suck to die. And just, they call you the thing, the thing, uh, wait, wait, do you think it's better to be called the thing after death or to be folding laundry for all eternity? I'd rather be the thing. Okay. Fair enough. President Taft's military aid, major Archibald, Butt wrote, <laughs> I'm yes, sorry. This yes. It. it wasn't unfortunate enough that his last name was Butt. They had to name him Archibald. Sir Archibald the Butt. <laughs> Man, his parents really hated him. Wrote to his sister Clara. Okay, so they can do normal names. They can't. They just fucking chose to fuck that dude for the rest of his life. <laughs> Got it. The ghost, it seems, is a young boy about 14 or 15 years old. They say that the first knowledge one has of the presence of the thing is a slight pressure on the so shoulder. 
as if someone were leaning over your shoulder to see what you were doing. President Taft ordered Butt to tell the White House staff that the first member to repeat the stories about the thing would be fired. That's a red flag. 100%. That, that, that's the kind of guy who's just like, okay, we're having a pizza party. Everyone gets one slice. One. <laughs> one. I'm taking the rest home. Apparently, here's a few uh, sightings of famous people. So we have Abraham Lincoln, which you covered. We have Willie Lincoln, um, who was all, you've also covered, standing yep. at the end of the bed. Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson, supposedly lying in bed in the Queen's bedroom, the Rose Room, lets out a guttural laugh that has been heard in the White House since the 1860s. <laughs> Mary Todd Lincoln claimed to have heard Jackson stomping and swearing. Andrew Jackson was a fucking menace. A hundred percent. That dude was a goddamn menace down to how he was, how he won the controversial election to threatening to duel people. If he disagreed, <laughs> this is a real thing. Andrew Jackson, like if he, he was, it was famous. And there were several times where he was like, you want to fucking duel for it? And they're like, you're the president. I can't, I don't give a fuck. Let's fucking do this <laughs> right now. He didn't give a fuck. Thomas Jefferson uh, apparently plays his violin in the yellow oval room. What is it about music that like we had this happen to us at Randolph and you guys will see that when it comes out, the, the music, something about hearing music in a place that everything else is gone is so much more terrifying than like in a lively place. Like, like if it was a haunted mall, for example, and you start hearing music, Oh, it's, it's whatever it's, but it's when you're in a old building and music starts, you just want to piss your pants. Yep. William Henry Harrison uh, haunts the attic, apparently. He was the first president to die in the White House. Imagine all the places in the White House and you get the attic. What were you doing in that attic, <sighs> that's, sir? That's the next question is what were you doing up there that that's where you, your residual energy was attached to? Unnamed British soldier. Okay. Uh, apparently he perished during the War of 1812, roams the White House grounds holding a torch. How bad would it be like you guys lost an entire country to us? Just saying, USA. <laughs> and then you had to fucking stick around in like <laughs> the the one place of a constant reminder of your entire country. Failure. Loss. Like <laughs> I would be so fucking mad. I don't Oh my God. I was gonna say, okay, no, I'm sorry, continue. Uh Anne Sir is the last one we'll cover. And sir apparently bangs the doors of the White House, pleading to see President Andrew Johnson. She was there to beg pardon for her mother. Yeah, we covered yeah, that we one. Yeah, we covered that one. I, I don't know. This has been a lot of fun. It, we we don't get to dive into topics where you can kind of be a little bit more free with it, but it's the fucking White House. Tell they're, us what you know. They're never inviting us there. So, like, we can talk as much shit about that place <laughs> as we want. It's okay. <laughs> No, so this has been a lot of fun. Let us know if you guys like this sort of thing, you know, a little bit more kind hearted, but it's just, there's stories that I feel like aren't told enough, especially with that being like our nation's fucking capital. This is illegal knowledge, actually. <laughs> so with that being said, guys, if you want to support the show, you want to support Tales from the Dark, the number one way to do that is go to Apple, go to Spotify, wherever you're listening, leave us a five star review. It helps a lot. I love to read the reviews and it helps us with the algorithm. Other way if you guys want access to some forbidden apps and we call them forbidden because we go off the fucking rails in some of these very quickly. Yeah. They, and what's funny is a lot of forbidden apps start off as regular show apps. And then we realize we can't publish this. And then it's, we probably shouldn't show this to anyone. And then it's Patreon. <laughs> Perfect. So, so again, one dollar gets you guys started. That's patreon.com slash tales from the dark. One buck gets you guys started. We have a, our, our movie night this Saturday. That's gonna be a ton of fun. Check us out there and then join the Facebook group. We have like 2,600 people now. Dank memes, you guys get behind the scenes stuff there, and it's just a great place to have conversations. But with that being said, Miss Brittany, do you have anything else that you want to add about the White House apart from the fact that our cats may be reincarnated DCs? <laughs> I do not. Okay, perfect. So with that being said, I think we're gonna have to add this episode of White House Ghost Stories to our never-ending, but our always growing Tales from the Dark. <laughs>